Welcome to A Flame for Christ, Tom Lee's to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, a priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this 23rd Sunday of Ordinary Time. So I know a young lady who comes to Camp Veritas who has kind of a very inspiring backstory. She was born in Connecticut to a very broken home, and after she was taken out of her home, she bounced around from one foster home to another for many years until finally at the age of 10, she was adopted by her current parents, who are very devout Catholics, and she was finally baptized at 10 years old. Now, four years later, at 14, she's absolutely on fire with love for Jesus Christ. And I kind of asked her over uh, the summer, I said, you know, how is it that you came to faith in Christ, right? I mean, you got baptized at 10, but like, you clearly really believe. So what is it that introduced you to Christ? And she told me something very interesting. She said, you know, I don't know how I came to love Jesus, but when I was baptized, I felt like I was coming home. What a beautiful description of life with Christ, finally coming home. Did you catch the immense power of today's collect, which is the proper name for the opening prayer? A lot of times we miss the opening prayer, but this one was so powerful. It said, O God, by whom we are redeemed and receive adoption, look graciously upon your beloved sons and daughters, that those who believe in Christ may receive true freedom and an everlasting inheritance. Let me unpack that for just a minute. So we are creatures, right? Really no better than just servants, really. We don't have the power to draw another breath if it's not given to us from above. But worse than that, we were disobedient servants. You know, we had spat in his face, disobeyed his commands, not just our first parents, but each and every one of us every day. But even though he knows our nothingness, he knows our arrogance, he knows our total weakness, he knows our rebellion, he still decided to offer us something phenomenal, to become the chance to become not servants and dust like we were created to be, but rather sons and daughters. Now to do that, he had to first pay back the consequences of our rebellion, which he paid on the cross. But once cleansed then through baptism, he raises us to a a dignity we could never deserve or even imagine, the dignity to be his sons and daughters, to share his very life, to open his home to us and to allow us to call him Father. Father, what a word to call God Father. What an intimacy that he allows us into. And this is the radical uniqueness of Christianity because our Muslim brothers and sisters call God Allah, which means master, but we can call him Abba, meaning father. That would have been blasphemous to Muslims. Our Jewish brothers and sisters would never consider themselves to be children of God. Yeah, there's people, maybe, but certainly not as family. And the blessings of God were supposed to be only for them and not for the whole world. Which is why in the first century, what Jesus did was totally radical, right? There's there's an important detail about today's gospel that a lot of times we gloss over. So where did Jesus do this miracle? It says that it was in the land of Tyre and Sidon, which is about 22 miles north of the border of the Holy Land. So this is pagan territory. Naturally, when Jesus does this miracle, these people are going to be overjoyed because it means that he's now doing it for the Gentiles. He's now inviting the blessings of sonship to the ends of the earth. All right, what a beautiful gift that is, you know, to be called as sons and daughters, to truly be as sons and daughters in baptism. But what's our takeaway? What does it mean practically for us? Well, three things. First of all, have you ever felt like you don't fit in? And I think the message of adoptive sonship in Christ means that we now do have a family, even if we feel like we don't fit in with others. I mean, the Catholic Church is sometimes called Holy Mother Church. And if you look at the colonnades surrounding St. Peter's Basilica, it's designed to resemble arms reaching out to the entire world. So maybe we were always on the outside as a kid. Maybe as a young adult, we found like we just couldn't find our friend group. Maybe as a fully grown adult, we feel alone. But in Christ, though, we are surrounded by, as St. Paul puts it to the Hebrews, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Our best friends can be Jesus and the saints, and what a friendship that can be. So even if you feel alone, it helps to realize that we're actually part of a bigger family, a family that embraces, loves, and welcomes us. We have found our home. I went to seminary with a remarkable man named Father Chase Hilgenbrink. Before seminary, he was a professional soccer player. He played on the New England Revolution, and he was so good that he was invited to try out for the Chilean national team in Chile. And he actually made the team and moved to Chile to play. The only problem was that he didn't speak any Spanish, and his teammates didn't speak any English. So after practice and after games, his teammates would all go out to the bar and party, and Chase would be completely left out. He felt so alone. 
But in that loneliness, he began to go to the only place that he knew he was welcome, the local Catholic church, and just simply sit in the presence of Jesus. And it was there that he felt at home in this foreign country. And through those long afternoons of silence, he began to discern God calling him to the priesthood. Now he serves as a priest in Illinois. But it was through that experience of loneliness that God revealed to him that he belonged to Christ, in the family of Christ, as brothers and sisters of Christ and sons of the Heavenly Father. And the Catholic Church then was his spiritual family. A second takeaway is that, you know, an awful lot of people struggle with their family. And I'll be honest, like no one has a perfect parents, right? And we've all got family issues. But it's good to know that we have a better family. Even if we've got issues with our earthly family, we've got a better father who can really truly teach us and take us far. Now, even if you've got great parents, like I do, I'm sort of very blessed, they can only take us to a certain limit. I remember, you know, one time in my life, I was faced with some difficulty and I thought to myself, man, you know, I wish my dad had prepared me for this. To which I felt God respond to my soul and say, you know, he couldn't prepare you for everything. So now turn to me and I will lead you. You know, whether we have great parents or we're dealing with wounds because of them, God wants to father us. And he does that through the joys and challenges of everyday life. We receive his fathering care by reading his word, the Bible, and by spending time with him in prayer. And by just having that spirit of docility, which asks him, Father, how are you leading me through this joy or sorrow? What are you teaching me? How are you forming me through this? Finally, it's important to remember that being a child of God means that we're called to live out of such a dignity. Imagine being the son of Michael Jordan or Martin Luther King Jr., right? It's kind of a certain expectation that you're going to live up to the family name and that you're going to succeed in life just because you're who you're related to. In that same way, as Pope St. Leo put it, Christian, remember your dignity. And now that you share God's own nature, do not return to, by sin to your former base condition. If we are adopted into God's family, we must make our family proud and glorify our Heavenly Father. No more living as if we're the star of our own melodrama. In fact, now rather we're sons of a father who we want to make proud. I want to close with a beautiful story of a saint who found her family in Christ. In South Sudan in the late 1800s, there was a young girl who was a beautiful daughter of a tribal chief. She grew up happy, but when she was only eight years old, Muslim slave traders raided her village and forced her to march 600 miles and sold her into slavery. She was so traumatized by this experience of losing her entire family that she actually forgot her name. And so the Muslims called her Bakita, which means fortunate or lucky in Arabic. She was traded from one master to another until she was finally sold to a wealthy businessman from Italy who took her back home. And so for many years, she served this wealthy Italian man. And so one day, he had to go on a lengthy business trip to the Middle East. So rather than take Bakita with him and you know, perhaps she could run away, he decided to entrust her to a local convent of nuns to make sure that she'd be safe. But living with these nuns was such a blessing for Bakita. For the first time since her capture, she felt like she was surrounded by love. The nuns treated her with this dignity and respect that she had never experienced, unlike you know, the, her slavery. And they taught her about the Lord Jesus. So she decided to receive baptism, taking the name Josephine, and rejoiced at this newfound family in Christ. So the man returns back home and demanded the Bequita be delivered back to him. But there was a law in Italy that forbade anyone from keeping a baptized person as a slave. So the man appealed to a judge, but the judge ruled that due to Bequita's baptism, she was now free. So when asked what she wanted to do with that newfound freedom, she replied she wanted to become a nun and join the convent because that was the best family she'd ever found. So she joined that convent and became very well known for her joy and her kindness and her merciful nature. Later on in life, she was one time asked by someone, what would you do if you met those men who sold you into slavery? And she replied, I would kiss their hands, for had that not happened, I would not have known Jesus Christ. What beautiful forgiveness and mercy, all because she found a family in the church and in the Lord, a family of grace, even richer than her family of blood. You know, we've all probably heard that term, blood is thicker than water. The idea that being loyal to our family is the highest value. But in Christ, we are adopted into a family more secure and more loving than even our biological brothers and sisters. Now we are sons and daughters of a heavenly father with an eternal inheritance awaiting us. As St. Aloysius Aloysius Gonzaga once said, it is better to be a child of God than king of the whole world. 